Hello, everybody. Welcome to the political vigilante. What are you doing now? You're making Gotham great again. Some of you just started you're like, what does the make Gotham great again mean? I'm a huge Batman fan. So uh, I'm a superhero. This was given to me by Pasta. This is, so I like the superheroes, mainly Batman. So somebody said early on, make Gotham great again. No, I'm not a Trumper. Um, but uh, I thank you for supporting the show. January 30th, doing Political Vigilante live here in Los Angeles at the Sycamore Tavern, the uh, dojo of comedy, ladies and gentlemen. My guest is going to be Jimmy Dore. So come out January 30th. The tickets are at GrahamElwood.com. Political Vigilante Live, special guest Jimmy Dore. Don't want to miss it. It's an intimate little comedy venue in Hollywood. It's awesome. It'll sell out. Jimmy's doing a stand-up show there June, uh, January 24th. That's already sold out. So he's going to be my guest January 30th at the Sycamore Tavern in Hollywood. It's on Sunset Boulevard, Political Vigilante Live. Uh, check it out. And of course, all my tour dates, Progressive Comedy Tour, added new shows, um, Oxford, Mississippi, we've added Austin, Texas. We just added New York City. All those are at GrahamElwood.com in the show notes. So today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which is a fine day to remember him. But always, we always hear the I Have a Dream speech, which is a fantastic speech and has a wonderful message. But you have noticed that the corporate media has basically eradicated any of his like anti-war, anti-capitalist, any of his socialist speeches have been taken. We don't hear, I didn't hear about a lot of these till recently. I didn't know he had said all of these things because I wasn't told this. I hear the, um, the, the I have a dream speech. Again, great speech. We hear this every year. It's a fantastic speech. It's a speech you should let your children hear. But why, are we, why don't we hear these other ones? Why don't we hear these other ones? So there was this video that was put out and, and the miserable liberal Steph Zamorano retweeted this, this YouTube video. And I want to play it for you and then we're going to talk. I'm going to go into some of the other speeches that he said that he took some flack for that a lot of people don't know about. At the end of his life, Martin Luther King Jr. was working on a campaign to ensure all Americans had a dignified standard of living with what is now referred to as a universal basic income. Or as he called it, a guaranteed minimum income for all people and for all families of our country. Hi, I'm Matt Orfala, and here's five reasons why MLK supported a guaranteed income. Reason number one, automation. The problems which are developing as a result of automation and cybernation. As far back as 1961, MLK saw a new economic trend of automation dissolving jobs. He called it a catastrophe and said, black and white, we will all be harmed unless something grand and imaginative is done. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. It will look at thousands of working people displaced from their jobs with reduced income as a result of automation while the profits of the employers remain intact and say this is not just. If a work program is impractical, we are demanding a guaranteed annual income at levels that sustain life in decent circumstances. Reason number two, poverty. Poor, black and white are still perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. MLK wrote he was convinced a guaranteed income was the most effective solution to poverty. He argued past anti-poverty programs failed because they were sluggish, entangled in bureaucracy, and indirect. We're likely to find that the problem of housing education instead of preceding the elimination of poverty, will themselves be affected if poverty is first abolished. The poor transformed into purchasers will do a great deal on their own to alter housing decay. Number th Let's talk about that for a second. Um, that was amazing. This is the thing that they always talk about when the corporatists or whatever say, oh, federal jobs guarantee. No one will work. They'll just sit around. 
No, they'll actually have money to contribute to the economy. And think about this. What society would look like if instead of everybody working two and three jobs to just barely get by, people had a federal jobs guarantee, right? And, and federal weight and universal basic income. What if some people had universal basic income? They'd have more time to be with their kids. I mean, how many of you are, you know, either a single parent or you have uh, your two income, both parents have to work to raise the kids. People would get more involved. How many people say, God, I wish I had time to be more involved in charity work and volunteer. I just don't have the time. I got to work. I got to take care of my family. I got to whatever. People would have more time to do that. What would society look like if people were like, oh, I have time to, I've always wanted to take that art class, learn that instrument. I'm not going to do it professionally, but I just want to, I want to be more artistic and more creative. I want to join a book club. I want to, how much better would our society be versus everyone's all stressed out and uh, what do we do? Blah, 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 blah. Can you imagine that? Because that's the thing. Jimmy Dore says this. A lot of other people say this. Robots don't buy things. So if robots are, have all the jobs and, no, and everyone's out of work, how's the economy going to go? That's why when they talk about a Green New Deal, we want a federal jobs guarantee within that that has universal basic income. Right? And that can fluctuate with the private sector. So if we have a recession and there's not a lot of private sector jobs, then there's, then there's federal government has jobs for everybody, right? We've studied MMT. Watch my MMT videos. You'll learn more about that. So then why was it, why didn't we hear about this? Why didn't we hear about this? At the end of his life, Martin Luther King Jr. was working on a campaign to ensure all Americans had a dignified standard of living with what is now referred to as a universal basic income. Or as he called it, a guaranteed minimum income for all people and for all families of our country. Hi, I'm Matt Orfala, and here's five reasons why MLK supported a guaranteed income. So, that's and and I'll put a link to that total video. You can watch the whole thing, and it goes into the more detailed. But I but I wanted to show that he was for that. That I didn't. Did you know that Dr. King was was in favor of of guaranteed income, federal universal basic income? Did you? I didn't know that. But he said it right there. It would fix poverty and housing if everyone has. People would be more involved in their community. Oh, well, that's a handout. They won't do anything. Look, they've done studies. The average amount of work in an eight-hour workday that the average American worker does that's actual work for their job or for their company is 3.5 hours a day. So less than half of an eight-hour workday is actually spent getting work done. The rest of the time, people are whatever. They're on social media. They're chatting. They're watching YouTube videos, whatever. They're not doing all of the jobs. So this notion that just handing people, they'll just be lazy. It's always people that are, that are, it's the one percenters that usually have a problem with this, right? So that's one thing that no, we don't know about Dr. King. And I want people to know this on, on MLK Day, who he was. The other thing he talked about, and it was part of that jobs guarantee, U UBI, is he saw there was poverty all over the country, not just in inner cities, not just in this, but white communities, black communities, Latino communities. He saw it. He saw it and went, this ain't right. It was the thing I talked about Fred Hampton. Why, why didn't, I, you know, I just found out about Fred Hampton a couple months ago by watching Chris Hedges on the Jimmy Dore show. So why do we not know about, here's another speech. This was beyond Vietnam, a time to break the silence. This was delivered April 4th, 1967 in New York City. Okay. About a year before his death. But three or four years before, after the I Have, I think the I Have a Dream speech was 1963. Here's some, um, some excerpts from it. And this is a speech that, you know, Lyndon Johnson was, was an ally of Dr. King and he hadn't really spoken out about Vietnam at this point. And people warned him, don't make this speech because being 
for or against the Vietnam War was a big thing. You got lumped into this case. You know, it was it was like you took a lot of flack. You got a lot of support on one hand, but you took a lot of flack. And everyone was like, just stick to civil rights. Just stick to civil rights. Don't talk about Vietnam. That's what they told him. This is his spe- excerpts from his speech. Money that should have been spent on Johnson's war on poverty. LBJ was was big on fighting poverty and schools and all this stuff. But it all got diverted for Vietnam. Not all, but a lot of it did. Was being lost in Vietnam's killing fields. He said, Dr. King, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. The speech distilled King's belief that racism, economic exploitation, and war were all connected as triple evils. He started to make this connection. Malcolm X started to make this connection. Fred Hampton did the first ever Rainbow Coalition, I believe in summer of 69, and then was killed by the FBI and the Chicago Police Department, murdered, basically. Fred Hampton, I did that video on that, unified poor Southern whites that had emig- uh, immigrated up to Chicago in a neighborhood in Chicago called Hillbilly Harlem, right? Bobby Kennedy started to wake up You know, he grew up in privileged Kennedy household, you know, East Coast money, Harvard educated, do whatever you got to do to win, just get politics and money and power and started to realize this isn't right. Bobby Kennedy started to see it. They all got assassinated around the same time. Here's another excerpt from this speech that he gave in New York City in April of 67. We are taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been able to seat them together in the same school. So he's talking about segregation. That's a bold statement. All this fighting about integrating schools and the riots and Governor Wallace and all this stuff, but we have no problem sending white boys and, and, and black guys over to Vietnam to fight so they can die there together. They can live together there. They can eat together, die together, be in war together come back with PTSD together, but they can't be in schools together. He just pointed out the hypocrisy of all of it. Why are we spending all this money? All the money that we spent to send them over there, why aren't we, you know, spending it on infrastructure here? As I have Walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. He was all about nonviolent protest. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their question hit home, and I knew that I would never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. So here we are in America today talking about justice and freedom and liberty and we just bomb people. We don't, we go to war without using Congress. The president really since 9-11, but even before that, I mean, we have the, the president hasn't gotten congressional approval for a war since World War II, right? We talk about Russia meddling in our elections and look what we do. Look what we've done in the Middle East. Look what we've done in Central America. I could go on and on about that. The Shah of Iran, Pinochet in Chile. I mean, we put those people in power and they were brutal dictators that we backed. So how can we sit there and talk about this? He was talking about it back in the late 60s. Here's another speech. The American Dream sermon delivered at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta on July 4th, 65. Now this was two years after 
the I have a dream speech. And he was starting, he was like, I haven't made that speech. And after two years of making that, after he was like, I'm not really seeing it get implemented. And this is an excerpt from it. I've seen my dream shattered as I've walked the streets of Chicago and seen Negroes, young men and women with a sense of utter hopelessness because they can't find any jobs. I've seen my dream shattered as I've been through Appalachia and I've seen my white brothers along with Negroes living in poverty and I'm concerned about white poverty as much as I'm concerned about Negro poverty. You ever heard this speech? You got to dig for this speech. They don't play this on CNN and every, every Martin Luther King Day, do they? I didn't read this in school. When I was in high school, we, had, we studied. We had Black History Month at my school and I never heard about this and I never learned about Fred Hampton. And I went to Evanston High, I went to a suburb of Chicago, which was one of the most, it was the, one of the first integrated suburbs of Chicago. It had been integrated for over a hundred years and we didn't learn about Fred Hampton and we didn't hear these speeches from MLK. I went to a pretty liberal, forward-thinking, progressive high school. Didn't learn about this. Isn't that interesting? We don't, they don't want us to know that basically MLK was a pretty serious socialist that he saw capitalism as the ills, capitalism creating racism. So as Kamala Harris announces her presidential run today with another just nothing platform, her, the first, I'm gonna tell you this right now, if you're running for president, the first words out of your mouth better mean, better say green new deal. If you don't have that, gee, I don't know if I can get behind you. I just don't know if I can get behind you. If you're just gonna give me platitudes and nonsense and bumper sticker bullshit, Green New Deal. He was talking about it. Before the environment was completely collapsing 50 years ago, he was talking about it. If he was alive today, he'd be like Green New Deal. So if you wanna honor MLK, share this video with everybody on your social media. People need to learn he was a brilliant man who had amazing ideas. And the corporatists who control the media have shaped his message into just fit into just, you know, the, the I have a dream speech was that, you know, and what he did in Selma, all valuable stuff, all important stuff. But isn't it weird that they conveniently leave out his anti-Vietnam War talk, his caring as much uh, about white poverty as Negro poverty. Why is this line not, where is this? Appalachia, that's white poverty. Where are we at today, West Virginia, 50% unemployment? Why do we know more about this guy? This, this is, and this was, he took flack that that, that anti-Vietnam speech that I showed you from, from 67 earlier in the video, he took flack within his own movement. They were like, Ugh, peace and, and, and civil rights, don't, those can't mix, which sounds kind of crazy today, but it's like, don't, mess, don't, don't talk about Vietnam. He said, that's not right. He just said, it's not right. He was confronted it in that quote. Telling people don't be violent when you're protesting in your cities in America. And then like, well, then the government, look what they're doing over in Vietnam. Thanks for watching the show, everybody. Go to the patreon.com. You get cool bonus content. You get exclusive social media posts. Uh, you get early access to the audio. You get to submit articles. You can do interviews with me. There's a lot of cool things to support the show. Watch the ads all the way through. Don't press skip ad. I don't get paid. That's a way to stick it to the capitalists, make them pay the political vigilante.